Thank you. So tonight we're going to talk about the little theater, decoding the symbols of the sanctuary service. Tomorrow morning we're going to do a talk answering difficult Bible questions and then becoming a spokesperson for God. How do you tell the story of the battle between good and evil from its inception through the history of, of the human race all the way to the culmination in the end? We're going to try and do, walk you through that battle and, and what it's like uh, from, from maybe behind the scenes and what the angels are seeing, why some of the things you see in the Old Testament happen. And then tomorrow afternoon we're going to do two talks. One's the developing brain, the influences um, transgenerationally, the things you're doing in your life that you'll pass down to your kids, your grandkids, and your great-grandkids. Uh, uh, gestationally, what's happening during pregnancy that affects the brain and early childhood development. We'll look at things that affect brain development along those lines. And then the uh, last talk we'll do is the aging brain. And that talk will be a distillation of four talks into one talk. So you get a little piece of four different talks on things you can do to actually slow the aging process and prevent dementia, uh, the late onset Alzheimer's type of dementia, even if you have a family history of late onset Alzheimer's dementia. So um, we'll talk about that tomorrow. So tonight, the little theater. When we talk about Bible symbolism, all Bible symbolism, whether it's parables, metaphors, illustrations, object lessons, rituals, all of them point to one reality. They all point to the reality of God's character and methods of love and His plan to heal and restore His creation. That's what they're all trying to teach us. If there's no reality, and this is very important when you look at Bible metaphors and Bible symbolism, if there's no reality to which the metaphor points, then it's no longer metaphor, it's fantasy. So one of the challenges is to see past the metaphor. And that's what I really try to do. I try to penetrate metaphorical stuff and say, okay, what's the reality to which it's trying to lead us? That's what we're going to do tonight. There's not one element in the Old Testament sanctuary system that is to be taken literally. Every aspect of it is a symbol of something else. It's all pointing to a larger reality. So in order to understand what the reality is, we have to decode the symbols. Have you seen this, uh, this uh, equation? E equals mc squared, and so we know what that means, right? Eternal life equals taking mass at church twice a week. Well, it, you know, it really means energy is equal to the mass times the speed of light squared. But, you see, if you don't understand the symbols, an E... M, C, and 2 are symbols. If you don't understand the symbols, then the equation becomes meaningless. Right? Worse, what's worse than not understanding the symbols is attributing a false meaning to the symbols. Because once you attribute a false meaning, then you actually think you have the knowledge and you stop looking for the meaning. If you don't know what they mean, at least you might be on the hunt. Okay, what does this mean? I don't understand it. Does symbols mean something? Let's, let's, let's discover. But once we attribute a false meaning, we don't even look anymore. That's worse. The sanctuary has been terribly misrepresented and misunderstood. Contributing to gross distortions about God, His character, his methods, the plan of salvation, which has kept millions of good-hearted people trapped in distorted belief systems. Paul talked about that at the end of time. They would have a form of godliness, but no power. Religion, but with distortion, is powerless. So, Christian Radio, I was listening to Christian Radio on my way home one day, and Easter 2016... And they were asking the question of two theologians, what is the meaning of the Old Testament sanctuary symbol and the sacrifices going on, the Old Testament sacrificial system? And so these are the answers that were given by two theologians. The first is an Old Testament theologian. It says, see, blood represents life, and there has to be the punishment of death for sin. So therefore, an animal had to take the punishment and give its life, its blood, so that the offerer could live. That was the substitution, what my former professor here at Moody used to call the exchange of life. The animal dies, the person lives. 
And so that's the reason for the Old Testament sacrifice for atonement. The New Testament scholar answering the same question. In the Old Testament, the death of an animal was required to take care of the human sin problem. And now we have not the death of an animal, but, the, but of the very Son of God who dies for us. And so his loss of blood is the thing whereby he succumbed on our behalf. Do you like these answers? Well, their answers are predicated on a false law construct. What do I mean by a false law construct? And, and I'm going to just take a moment here and just expand on this for those who are not familiar with, with what we show and teach in our ministry. When you hear the word law, what comes to mind? Most people think rules. Yeah. But how about if I say the laws of gravity, the laws of physics, the laws of health? Are you now thinking rules or are you thinking something else? See, God is the creator. He builds reality. He builds space, time, energy, matter, life. His laws are the laws upon which all reality function. Human beings, we cannot make reality. So we make up rules that we threaten to punish if you break the rules. Christianity became infected, and I won't go through all the evidence, there's a whole several other talks that go through this, but Christianity became infected and, ortho, and it became part of orthodoxy when Constantine converted with the idea that God's law functionally functions no different than the laws human beings make. A system of rules without any inherent consequence requiring the rule giver to police breaches in the rule and inflict punishments for rule breaking. This idea has corrupted Christianity. It's not the teachings of the Scripture. The Scripture teaches that God is love, his laws are the laws upon which all life are designed to operate. Functionally, love is the principle of giving. And Paul says in Romans 1.20 that God's divine nature is seen in what he has made. Every breath you take, you give away carbon dioxide to the plants. The plants give oxygen back to you, a never-ending circle of giving upon which life is built. You are free to transgress the law. You can take a plastic bag and you can tie it over your head and you can selfishly hoard your carbon dioxide to yourself. But the wages of that is death. See, transgressing God's design laws takes you out of harmony with how our Creator has actually constructed life to exist. And life does not actually exist out of harmony with His laws. Only death happens there. But when you substitute design law for system of rules, then you have, to create, you have to teach ideas that God, instead of the, the lover of our souls who is working through Christ and all of his agencies to heal what's broken in us, instead becomes the source of inflicted pain and suffering and execution, and we need to create theologies that are designed to hide us and protect us from God. You don't think you've heard theologies that are designed to hide you and protect you from God? Covered by the robe of righteousness, and so when the Father looks at you, he can't see your wickedness. Washed in the blood, so when the Father sees the blood of His Son, He'll remember the sacrifice. Have the blood applied to the record books in heaven so it erases the record of your sin. Have Jesus stand as an intercessor between you and the Father to plead His blood to the Father so the Father will remember the sacrifice and not use His power to kill you. Notice, functionally, all of these doctrines are designed to hide you or protect you from God. Why? Because the false law construct gets Christians to think that God is the problem. God, in order to be just, must use His power to punish our sin. That would be true if His laws work like human laws. But Isaiah says His ways are higher than our ways. He doesn't function like us. His kingdom is not of this world. And the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. Sin, when full grown, brings forth death. Death does not come out from God. Death comes out from unremedied sin. And I tell you, as I travel around the world speaking, what I found is that mo most Christians are more afraid of God who is trying to save them than the sin in their life which is killing them. So that's the big overview on the two law constructs. We will unpack it more this weekend. 
But keep that in mind. God is creator. Do you worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is? The creator whose laws are the laws upon which reality are built? Or do you worship the universal dictator who makes up rules and runs his universe like Caesar runs Rome, and he's watching over you and following you everywhere you're going to go to keep track of every sin, and if you don't actually get legal accounting for that, then he will use his power to torture you and kill you. Which view? I think that second view that I just said is a corruption. So, the answers that these two theologians gave are all based on the idea that sin requires some legal blood payment. Well, what does the Scripture actually tell us? And they were saying animal blood was actually what took care of it in the Old Testament. Here's what Hebrews says. The gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only matters of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Could animal sacrifices ever resolve the sin problem? If they could, why would Jesus need to come anyway? Right? So this idea that in the Old Testament sacrificial system was somehow designed to take care of sin is wrong. It was never able to take care of sin. And notice again what's happening here. Not able to cleanse the conscience of the worshiper. That's healing. That's cleansing the inner being. That's renewal. That's rebirth. That's recreation. That's regeneration. That's not legal. So animal sacrifices can never take away the sin. So God told them in the Old Testament times, Isaiah 1, the multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fatted animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. And what's justice? Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. That's what biblical justice looks like. Or Hosea 6.6, 6, I love this one. I want your constant love, not your animal sacrifices. I would rather have my people know me than burn offerings to me. So this idea that animal sacrifices were not able to take care of the sin problem was not a New Testament idea. It was all through the Old Testament. So if animal sacrifices could not cleanse from sin, then what was the purpose? Why? Theater. Drama. To engage the sinner in activities that were designed to teach and lead them to experience the genuine transformation. Consider what it would have been like for you after committing a sin if you had to then go and take your pet Maybe your dog. Confess your sins on the head of your dog. Look your dog in the eye and then cut its throat. Did anybody kind of just get a sick feeling inside? That's what God wanted them to feel. Sin is disgusting. It's sickening. It kills. It hurts. It maims. It's cruel. Sin is cruel. God's not. Sin is. And he wanted them to be disgusted with sin first. And then to teach something. So there's a great stage play here. The entire Le Levitical system was a drama, a play, an acted out production, a little theater. The system was given to a group of former slaves who basically couldn't read and write at the time they came out of Egypt. So on a grand scale, God directed them through Moses to build a very elaborate stage. Really cool stage. Had neat props, really cool costumes, and a detailed script. I think some call that Scripture. The children of Israel were the cast, the acting troupe, to act out in recurring cycles God's plan to heal and to save Humanity. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4.9, it seems to me that God has put us who bear His message on stage in a theater in which no one wants to buy a ticket. This is theater. 
They were acting out of drama. Salvation was not dependent on acting in the play. In other words, you did not have to act, uh, sacrifice a temple to be saved. You did not have to be a member of the acting troupe. You did not have to be part of Israel to be saved. To be saved, you only had to experience the reality to which the enactment was pointing. Remember Naaman, Melchizedek, Jethro, the widow who, who housed Elijah, and there are many more Old Testament figures who were not part of Israel, who did not sacrifice a temple, who were saved. A person could join the acting troupe, though. And if you joined the acting troupe, then you had to follow the script. Ruth and Rahab come to mind. But once, uh, once a member of the cast, you had to follow the script. If, if a cast member refused to follow the script, or should we say the Scripture, they were removed from stage. You see God removing people from stage because they're not following the script. What does a Broadway director do when an actor who won't stay on script? What do they do? They take them off stage and they replace them. This is what God was doing in the Old Testament. This is what God did many times in the Old Testament. But just because somebody was not on script or not part of the drama doesn't mean they were eternally lost. Think of Hagar, who, who was uh, intimate with Abraham, Ishmael and Esau, descendants of Abraham. They were not part of, this, of the stage play. But we know that God gives special blessings that Ishmael talks specifically about. The actors, Israelites, got so far off script at one point that God had the entire stage torn down. And for 70 years, the play was not acted out. Yet people were still being saved without sacrificing a temple. Think of Daniel and the three worthies. They were not sacrificing a temple. It wasn't required for salvation. This is all theater. Eventually, they rebuilt the theater the stage and began reenacting the play at the end of the 70 years. But some didn't return. Esther, Mordecai, they stayed away. They didn't return and sacrifice the temple. But God did not abandon them. Why wouldn't He abandon them? Because God is not interested in theater. He's interested in the reality to which the theater points. Changing hearts and minds and restoring unity with Him. Everybody with me so far? But they became so consumed with following the letter of the script that they failed to comprehend the reality when the reality, Jesus, came and stood among them, and thus they rejected and killed Him. So God had the stage torn down again and brought in new helpers to take the reality, Jesus Christ, to the world. So, consider the black death of the 14th century. The people are told by their religious leaders that this is punishment from God for sin. You and I know that it was a bacterial infection from carried by fleas, Yersinius pestis. Now, imagine you had an antibiotic that would cure, which we have an antibiotic today. Now, imagine back then you actually had an antibiotic that could cure, let's say penicillin. And let's say penicillin comes in a red little capsule. But what would you do to help people know, watch for, see these symptoms, take penicillin, get well? Would, would, it, would a sending out flyers help? Remember, this is the 14th century. How many people read and write? Flyers aren't going to help. Books aren't going to help. Posters aren't going to help. Maybe you would have a little play and have actors go around and act a little play. And in the little play, people come out on stage with little lesions, little red lesions on, and they're acting sick and feverish, and then somebody maybe in white robes comes out and gives them a red little jelly bean, and the jelly, red jelly bean symbolizes the red penicillin. And they take it, and once they take the jelly bean, they wash off the sores and they stand up and dance. And the play simply says, when you have these symptoms, take your medicine, you'll get well. A little simple. But one acting troupe, uh, one acting troupe in one city, they ran out of red jelly beans. They started using blue ones. And the original troupe with red jelly beans, this caused a major split. They began to argue that that's not orthodox. You should only use red jelly beans. Blue jelly beans should not be used. 
Do you understand the application here? We started out with baptism by immersion, and, and then, I don't know if you know the history, but some people found themselves imprisoned, uh, uh, getting ready to be fed to the lions, and, and the Christians who were being persecuted by Rome were giving witness, and giving witness to Jesus Christ, and some of those people were converted in prison, and they wanted to be baptized, but there was no, there was no, no rivers, no lakes, so they took cups of water and they sprinkled them. That's where it came from. Now, well, that's not orthodox. We're going to have two groups now. Let's do immersion and let's do sprinkling. You know, wouldn't it be sad if people took their jelly beans regularly and acted it out, but when the plague came, they never took penicillin? They just took their jelly beans. Wouldn't it be sad if people were getting baptized by immersion, but they never had their hearts immersed into, into the Holy Spirit to be renewed, which is what it symbolizes. So the theme, what is the theme of the Old Testament sanctuary? Humanity, here's the theme. Humanity is separated from God by sin. God is working through Christ to bring humanity back into unity with himself and heal them from sin. That's the theme. So if you look at the camp of Israel, what's symbolized by this? In the very center, we find the sanctuary, the tabernacle, how they camped. Around the tabernacle, camped, I wonder if this laser works, maybe barely. Around the tabernacle, immediately around it, were the Levites, the priests. And then outside the Levites, on four sides, we had three tribes, on, on all four sides, so 12 tribes. How can they have 12 plus, that's 13 tribes? I thought there was only 12 tribes, because Joseph was split into two. So we have the two tribes here that represent Joseph. So we have 12 tribes around the camp, plus the Levites in between. What is symbolized by this? Well, God is at the center. People are separated from God. And the Levites are in between. What do you think that's saying? So who do the Levites represent? Symbolically, who do the Levites represent in the large reality of this world? The priesthood of believers. The priesthood of believers. That's who the Levites represent. then who would the 12 tribes represent? Well, in, in, this, uh, in the Bible, how many groups are there? When Jesus comes again, how many groups? There's always only really two groups. The children of God and the children of the world. If the Levites are the children of God, then who are the rest of the tribes? This is a stage play, remember? This is acting. Somebody has to act the role of the unconverted. The twelve tribes, notice, from the four corners of the earth, north, east, west, and south, from the four corners of the earth. This is all the peoples of the entire world are symbolically represented here. That's the whole world. They represent. And they're the unconverted peoples of the world that God's people, the Levites, are to go out and bring to him. That's what's represented in the way the camp was laid out. Moses represents Christ in his pre-incarnate state, before his incarnation in Bethlehem. Moses spoke to God face-to-face -face as man speaks to a friend, confronted the ruler who was holding the people in slavery, set them free, and built the sanctuary. Jesus, prior to his incarnation, spoke to God face to face, left the ruler of the universe, came to earth, confronted the evil being who was holding humanity in slavery of sin face to face, and established or built his sanctuary. What do I mean? Zechariah 6, 12 through 13. Tell him, this is what the Lord Almighty says, here's the man who will, whose name is the branch. It's referring to Jesus. And he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne. He left heaven to build or establish his temple. Remember he said to them, you will destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again? So Moses represents Jesus in his pre-incarnate state. The lamb represents Jesus in his incarnate state here on earth. The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John the Baptist said of Jesus. And the high priest represents Jesus 
after his incarnation, his death on the cross, his resurrection, his victory, and his ascension into heaven. Our heavenly high priest. And it says in Hebrews 4, 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. So Jesus is represented by Moses before incarnation, the Lamb during incarnation, the high priest after incarnation, various aspects of what he was doing for us. What about the court? What do we understand about the court? What lesson is being taught when you look at the system? What law lens are you using? So what is the problem that sin caused that the plan of salvation is designed to fix? Think that through. Adam and Eve sinned. What's, the, what's now the diagnosis? What's the problem? When Adam sinned, did God get changed? Did God's law get changed? Did humankind get changed? Get your mind around that. Just pause right there as a platform, as a foundation. Wait, God never changes. He didn't change. God's law didn't change. The condition of humankind changed. Then where will the action point have to be in the plan of salvation to resolve this problem? Will, will, will something have to be done to God? Will something have to be done to God's law? Will something have to be done in mankind? Yes. And guys, that's not what's commonly taught in Christianity. What's commonly taught in Christianity is Jesus died to pay your penalty to appease the wrath and propitiate the wrath of the Father to deal with the legal consequences that God was somehow offended. There's these other things that are creating barriers. So when you understand this, though, yes, God didn't get changed. In fact, put the piece, hopefully a lot of Bible texts are dropping into your mind right now. Like if God is for us, who can be against us? He who didn't spare his son, but gave him up, well, not along with him, give us all things. God was in the son, reconciling the world to himself. For God so loved the world. In other words, you will find a consistent theme in Scripture that when man fell into sin, God immediately was for us. Not against us. So we do, do we interpret the symbols to fix man from the sin problem, or do we interpret the symbols to do something to God or to God's law. You will hear it commonly within the Adventist church by many theologians that it's to do something to God or God's law, particularly the law. So the bronze altar, what does it represent? Well, it was made out of a porous wood covered in bronze. Bronze is an impure metal. What do I mean by impure? It's not a pure single metal. It's a combination of metals. It's copper and zinc or copper and tin or copper and nickel. It's an impure metal. Porous wood, impure metal. What's it represent? Altars represent, in the sanctuary service, the human heart. This is, and if you rec re remember the stage play, here's the stage play, we have the world out here, the, the sinful people of the world, we have the Levites, we're going to go, we want to bring people to Christ. The first most distant point in, God is in the most holy place, that's where the Shekinah is, the furthest point away as we begin to approach God is the bronze altar. It's the furthest point. That's the point of conversion. That's the sinful heart represented here in bronze, where we are diagnosed as dead in trespass and sin. The impure heart with the impure metal diagnosed as terminal. It's the starting point in salvation. The blood was placed in the sacrifice. When we get to it, was first placed at the base of the altar. And you think that through. The base, that's the foundation. And then after it was poured around the base of the altar, which would represent a complete foundational change or cleansing, conversion, then it was placed on the horns of the altar, and the horns of the altar represent defects of character. So once we're converted, we have a new heart, we have a new desire, now we have character defects to overcome, so that goes on the horns of the altar. Uh, Jeremiah 17.1, The sin of Judah was written with pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the tablets of the heart and upon the horns of your altar. These are, these are those defects of character. That's where the blood gets applied there. The inner fat which is removed and burned on the altar at the time of the sacrifice, the inner fat represents 
the victory of Christ in destroying the infection of sin. Some might call it the carnal nature, fear and selfishness when he in Gethsemane was tempted in every way just like we are, yet without sin. And you saw his agonizing with the human emotions that tempted him, but he gave himself in love perfectly overcoming, destroying that fear drive, that selfish drive within. This is why, when you understand that's what the fat burning represents, that inner drive of selfishness deep within us, why it was always a pleasing aroma to burn the fat for the Lord. You ever wonder, why, why was it a pleasing aroma? Why would he like to smell that? Because in the stage, in the symbolism, it, it, it represents burning sin out of hearts. Boy, doesn't it please? If you had a child with leukemia and you were given radiation therapy or some, can some cancer, and you're giving radiation therapy and you're burning out the, the, the cancer to save your child's life, isn't that a pleasing thing? That's what the burning of the fat is. It's burning the sin out of our hearts. And the fire represents the Holy Spirit uh, before. Uh, the Holy Spirit, the fire represents the Holy Spirit. Before the blood is applied, it's the Holy Spirit working on the heart to bring us to conversion. After the blood is applied, it's the Holy Spirit working to cleanse, empower, enlighten, ennoble, and renew, and so forth. The laver, which was, uh, represents the washing of the Holy Spirit, it was built from the mirrors that the women brought out of Egypt. That's what they built the laver out of, which represents the mirrors, represents the Word of God. And the water represents the Holy Spirit, so the two together, as we read the Word of God, with the Holy Spirit, our minds are being cleansed. The high priest and the daily priest, both, washed in the labor. None of the other members of Israel did. High priest and daily priest. Washed in the labor and always washed before doing any ministry. Can you figure out the symbolism? Well, do unconverted people... Ask the Holy Spirit to cleanse their heart. Do the unconverted people dive into God's Word to, to, to fill their hearts with the Word? No. Only the converted. It's why only the Levites and the high priest did. And they did it before ministry. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to take time in God's Word and invite the Holy Spirit in before we go out to minister to other people. That's what, what enables us to do so. And that's what the washing and the labor represents. Vessels were used to carry blood. After the animal was sacrificed, the blood would be caught into a vessel and it would be carried around to different points for different purposes. This is symbolic of God's people. The vessels represent the people on earth who carry the truth and the love of Jesus to others. Do you remember? The life is in the blood, and this is the life of Christ. And the life is only revealed in living beings. Thus, the living beings carry the life of Christ. And this is what it says about Paul. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for Paul is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name, my character, my life, my blood, in other words, before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. The daily priest in white robes, Remember the white robes? We want the robe of Christ's righteousness. This is symbolic, symbolism. The robe, okay? They have the white pure robes with the priesthood of believers who have character like Christ within. That's what the white robe represents, a pure character. The holy place. And so the courtyard represents the world in which we're out witnessing. And, and, and the unconverted peoples are being brought into conversion. The holy place represents the church. And it's, if you know about the holy place, everything was covered in gold. Bronze altar, impure metal. Gold is a pure metal. No impurities in the gold, see? Uh, the door of the, from between the holy place and the court, the door there represents Christ. And the door uh, was always open. They never closed the door. And so the door representing Christ, who is our gate, I am the gate. You know it talks about the pen, I am the gate, I am the way in. Um, only the, the, the sheep come in through the gate, the rustlers try to get over other ways, okay? Christ is the door. And the light from the lamp would shine out of the door into the court. Which is, of course, the truth about Christ shining out to the, from the church into the world to bring people to Christ. The lampstand is representative of both the living 
and written word. Jesus is the word made flesh. The written word and the living word is the lampstand. The central stand in the lampstand represents Jesus. The central stand, Jesus. Six branches represent mankind, human beings. He is the vine, we are the branches. And six connected to Christ makes seven, it's the number of perfection. Only when we're connected to Christ are we perfected. And so we are healed and able to shine light only as we're connected to Christ. The oil represents, in the lamp, represents the Holy Spirit who takes what Christ has achieved in his victory on earth and reproduces it in us. And the bowls where the flame burns represents our hearts where the word enlightens our minds and the spirit burns within. Remember the men on the road to Emmaus, did our hearts not burn within us as the word was broken to us or spoken to us? And only the high priest trimmed the wicks. Get your mind around this now. Only the high priest trimmed the wicks on the lamp. And he did it morning and evening. Every day. Meaning, only Christ works in your heart to trim away the things that interfere with your ability to shine bright for Him. And as you allow Him to work in your heart, I stand at the door and knock if you let me in. He will trim away the things that interfere and allow you to shine brighter and brighter for Him. Morning and evening, every day. The table was wood covered in gold, which represents the table, represents Jesus, our incarnate wood, became human, perfection covered in gold, perfect sinless gold, Savior, who is the source of all of our spiritual nurturing or nurturance. The border of the table was a hand breadth. It was the only measure of the sanctuary that was not in a cubit. Everything else was in cubits. But the border of this was a hand's breadth, symbolically of God's protective hand around his son. Twelve loaves of bread, unleavened bread, represent Christ. And you know, the, he said it himself, I am the bread of heaven that has come down. The unleavened bread, leaven is ye yeast or is representative of sin. He had no sin, so he, the twelve loaves, and there's twelve because there's twelve tribes, and the twelve tribes represent all the peoples of the earth, which means there's twelve loaves, which means what Christ has done is sufficient for the entire world. Incense on top of the twelve loaves represents the sweetness of Christ. And the wine is the perfect character, the sinless life of Christ. And then notice, every Sabbath, the daily priest would join the high priest in the holy place to eat the bread from the table. The holy place represents the church. So every Sabbath, the believers are to gather in church with our heavenly high priest to partake of the word of God. Golden altar. Now, the bronze altar are the hearts of the unconverted. What do you think the golden altar represents? The hearts of the converted people. Now those are the hearts of those who have accepted Jesus. We've got a new heart and a right spirit. We have circumstances of the heart by the spirit. And gold represents the purity of Christ. We have a new heart now. That's what the golden altar represents, heart of the saved. Prayers um, are only offered from those who actually have brought Christ into their hearts. And so the incense was burned on the golden altar, not the bronze altar. And the incense represents the prayers going up from the hearts of the converted. Incense also represents the character of Christ that, that, that is a sweet aroma. The incense would waft out over the camp. And so the lives of the people become a sweet aroma in the community as, the, as their hearts are renewed. And remember the hearts where the sweet incense is burning is represented by the golden altar, drawing the unsaved into the camp. This is 2 Corinthians 2, 4, 14 and 15. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. See, the incense burning in our hearts, the sweetness of Christ as we live in the community is, the, is symbolic also of the incense being burned. Fire in the 
golden altar represents the Holy Spirit in our hearts. The horns of the golden altar, do you notice, are significantly smaller in size than the horns of the brazen altar. Because those who have accepted Christ and have been converted have had the blood, the life of Christ, the, the, the power of Christ working in their life on their horns, on their defects of character, and thus their defects of character are smaller. And these are the vestigial remnants of those character defects being eliminated. That's why the horns are smaller. Golden crown. There's a golden crown on this altar. There was not a crown on the brazen altar. And the golden crown represents the crown of victory that we have in Christ. There is no victory for the, for the unconverted. That's why there's no crown on the brazen altar. The curtain. Now, if you were a priest, a daily priest, and you were in the holy place, doing your ministry in the holy place, and you have love for God in your heart, and you look back to the, to the most holy place where the Shekinah would be, and you want to see God and have an intimate, closer encounter with Him, what would, what would be the problem with that? Would there be something in the way? What would you actually see as you look towards the most holy place? You would see a veil, right? Which is obstructing your view of God. This veil... M- I can't see God because this veil's in the way, right? So, what happened to this veil? It was destroyed, right? It was destroyed when? At at the crucifixion. Now, it's very important. Think with me. Now, this is the only part of the sanctuary system that God directly, with His own hand, ripped or shredded or destroyed. Now, human beings destroyed lots of other stuff, but God destroyed this. What does it symbolize? What does the veil symbolize? You will be told by those who hold the other view of the law, who hold the human law view, that the veil represents Jesus and God struck him down. God punished him for our sins. God killed him on the cross. And thus God ripped that veil because he had to punish Jesus. Do you like that view? That's what you'll be taught by the majority of Christian theologians. But it doesn't fit with the symbols at all. Because this veil, functionally, if you understand the theater, the veil is obstructing our ability to see God. Did Jesus obstruct our ability to see God? Or did Jesus say, if you see me, you've seen the Father? He came to open a new and living way through the veil to the Father, didn't he? Yes, he did. So Jesus destroyed something at his death, and in destroying something at his death, now a new and living way is opened to the Father. So I think the veil represents Satan's lies about God that obstruct our ability to see him and our own sinful, fear-based, carnal, self-centered natures. That's what the veil represents. That's what obstructs us from God. The angels on the veil represents God's agencies that are there to help us do battle with the lies of Satan and help us do battle with our own selfish natures, but angels cannot break through the barrier. They can't get through it. They can't destroy it. They can't make the way back to God. They can't do it. Jesus, though, destroyed both the lies about God and the carnal nature that drive to survive, that fear-based, self-centered impulse that we have. And thus, he destroyed those things, opening a new and living way back to God. Hebrews 2.14, By his death he destroyed him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. Did you notice the devil holds the power of death? Have you done... You know know what that power is? So John 17.3, Life eternal is... Anybody know? This is life eternal that you might... Okay, so life eternal equals knowing God. Then eternal death equals not knowing God. So Satan's power of death then are the lies that he tells about God that keep us from knowing Him. That's his power. Jesus destroyed him who holds the power of death. How? I am the way, the truth. In the life. He destroyed it by revealing perfectly the truth that destroys the lies. 
He also says, 2 Timothy 1.10, that he destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light. Destroyed death? Well, what's, where does life originate? In God. That's right. God is the originator of life. And it flows out from God into all of His creatures who live in harmony with Him. In other words, who are not out of harmony. And we call in the Bible people who are out of harmony with God, we call that sin. That's what we call that. In harmony, righteousness. Out of harmony, sin. And so, life originates in God, flows out to all beings in harmony, but sin severs that connection, and thus destroying death destroys the sin that severs our relationship with God. Hebrews 10, 19, and 20. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. That's exactly right. Uh, And then Paul talks in Corinthians, trying to help us see what the veil really represents. He says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age, who's the God of this age? That's Satan. Has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light, the Shekinah, of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You see, that veil represents those lies that keep people from seeing the beautiful truth, the glory of God. But Jesus destroyed those lies and opens a new and living way through. If we make the veil of Jesus' body rather than the assumed fallen nature and the lies of Satan, then we have God killing Christ at the cross. And I reject that. So the curtain, when we recognize the reality of what Christ was, God was actually accompanying through Christ, and what actually obstructs us, then we realize God, through Jesus, destroyed death, Satan's power, and Satan's works. That's what he did. All right, most holy place. The universe is cleansed. What, what's, what's it represent? So out here in the court, we have a, a sinful world with sinful people, but we have uh, the, 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 the priests of believers working to bring them back into unity. In the, in the holy place, we have the church, which is being purified. And then in the most holy place, we have a universe reconciled back to unity or oneness with God at one minute. And in the most holy place, we have the Shekinah presence of God. We have the angelic host represented by the angels on top of the ark. We have a lid of solid gold, and the lid of solid gold represents Jesus Christ. And uh, Paul actually uses the term for the lid called hilasterion uh, in Greek in Romans 3, referring specifically to Christ. Christ is the hilasterion, the lid to the ark. And then we have a box beneath the lid. Now, what does the box beneath the lid represent? Well, it was made out of a porous wood, covered now all in gold. Now, the bronze altar, remember, porous wood covered in bronze. This is an impure metal. Now we have porous wood covered in a pure metal. Okay, Those are sinners who have been restored to Christ's righteousness. That's what this box represents. Unity with God, regeneration of character, we're pure in heart, we're righteous. These are the righteous, we're the saved. Now, what was contained in this box? Anybody know what was kept in this box? Say it, say it. Ten commandments, what else? Aaron's rod and manna. Do you know what order they went in there? What went in first? Nope. The, the manna went in first. Exodus chapter 16. The manna went in. Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 20. The law went in. And then Aaron's rod. Now what's the symbolism? The, the manna represents, so manna, the manna represents Jesus. I am the bread of heaven that has come down. Remember he told them, I am the bread of heaven. So we must first partake of Jesus. That's what we must first do in our sinful experience. We have to come to Jesus. We have to surrender to Jesus. We have to partake of him into our hearts. Take Jesus in. And when we take Jesus in, what do we do? We're one to trust. And so we open our heart to him, don't we? 
and we open our heart to him, it says in Hebrews, I'll write my law on your heart and mind. And once he writes his law, which is not a system of rules, his law is the law of love, the protocols upon which life are built, he renews us with his law of love. And once that happens, we who were dead in our trespass and sin bring about the peaceable fruits of righteousness, Aaron's dead rod that budded fruit. Isn't that exciting? I get chills every time I tell that. I just love that. It's beautiful symbolism. So those in the penal view, if you, if you listen to theologians that, that, that buy into that imposed law construct, they will tell you that inside the ark was the broken law. And Jesus, our righteousness, covers the broken law. And when you drop blood on there at the Day of Atonement, he's atoning for the broken law. Do you hear this? Broken law, broken law, broken law. You've heard it, right? How many, how many have heard that? Yes. Well, guys, Moses came down off the mountain twice with two sets of laws, right? Two written by God in stone. What happened to the first set? He broke them, didn't he? He shattered them. He smashed them. What happened to the second set? Did he break the second set? Was it broken or unbroken? Which set went in the ark? The unbroken law. This idea that this is the broken law being covered by Christ, being paid for by blood, is a lie. It's based on the human law construct. It, the truth is, it's regenerational. We partake of Christ, and Christ puts His law in us. I'll write my law in your hearts and minds. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. This is the new covenant. It's regenerational. It's healing. It's renewal. It's making you like Christ again. And that's what the symbolism shows. It was the unbroken law that went in. They had a broken set. If they wanted to have the symbolism that this is the broken law, they would have put the broken pieces in. Jesus is the, is the lid. Now, now, notice this. He's the solid gold, and he is the connecting link which unifies and brings the entire universe back into oneness again. You see, um, the Shekinah glory rested on the, above the lid, touching the lid. The angel hosts are touching the lid. And the sinners, the box, are touching the lid. All the universe are connected together again through Jesus Christ. And so the Scripture says in Ephesians, And He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and earth together under one head, even Christ. And do you see how the symbolism just fits it perfectly? Now, let's, now we've got kind of decoded what the symbols mean. Let's try to read the meaning of a couple of the sacrifices. So this is the sin offering for a non-priest Jew. Non-priest. One of the 12 tribes outside. And the 12 tribes represent the unconverted peoples of the world. So this is a sin offering for somebody who's coming to conversion, basically. The sinner would confess his sin on the head of the animal, showing that sin happens in the mind. Then, the sinner, not the priest, will cut the... Now, what's symbolic here? Did you get a sense of God's law when I went just that real short example about the law of respiration? The law of love is the principle of giving. Every living system, I gave you respiration. The oceans give their waters to the clouds. They rain over the lands, forming lakes, rivers, and streams, flowing back to the ocean. Never-ending circle of giving upon which life is built. If a body of water separates from that circle and does not give, it stagnates, and everything in it dies. The, the flowers give their pollen to the bees. The bees give their industry to the plants. If either one stops giving, what happens? They die. For an economy to be healthy and vibrant, the money has to be in circulation. If you take the money out of circulation, the economy dies. Every living system, this is the law of life. And so what's being shown here? Sinner confesses sin on the head of the animal, and then the sinner cuts the circulation. The life is in the blood, it says in Leviticus, and what does the blood do? The blood just circles, it just circles, it just circles. And as long as the circle is intact, life. But as soon as you sever the circle, what happens? Death, you break my design, there's no life when you break my design. This is what God is trying to teach us. Very straightforward stuff. The animal represents the sinless Jesus who took our terminal condition upon himself in order to fix humanity and become our remedy. 
That's what the animal represents. The blood represents the sinless, perfect life or character of Jesus. And the blood was carried by ministering priests in vessels. And both the priest and the vessels represent the believers carrying the gospel message, the truth of God's character and love and nature to the world. Blood was, after the priest would catch the blood, they would pour it first at the base of the altar, representing the foundational conversion change of the heart, that, that impure heart is being cleansed by the blood of Christ coming into the base of the heart. And then the blood was applied to the horns of the altar, um, representing the, 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 the removal of the character defects in the person. Then the organs were washed, representing the cleansing of the inner man, removal of the guilt, removal of the shame, removal of the, the burden that we've lived under before we came to Christ, all that inner turmoil that we've had. You know what? Inner turmoil, inner organs are being washed. We're being cleansed in the inner person. Separating the fat from the organs, burning away, is burning away the selfish drives and the fear drives that make us act so self-centeredly. It's burning out with the, burning those things out. And the burning of the organs represents the work of the Holy Spirit to burn out our old desires and recreate a new heart within. Motives. And the priests then would eat the flesh of this particular sacrifice. And this, the meat of the animal, represents the body of Jesus or the, or the Word of God. And so as we minister to others the Word of God, we are strengthened in our own journey and our own relation with Christ as we do that. Do you see the beautiful symbolism here? Decode the meaning for the sin offering for the priest. Now, we just did the, the non-priest Jew. They represent the unconverted people coming to conversion. Now, what about the priest? Who do they represent? These are church members. These are people who are already converted to Christ who have committed sin. They confess their sin on the head of the animal, also showing that sin happens in the mind. They also, not the, 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 not the ministering priest, but the priest who has sinned, Severs the same lesson. Sin severs my design, results in death. The animal represents Jesus who took our terminal condition upon himself to fix it and become our remedy. The blood represents the sinless character of Jesus. Blood carried by the, pri the priest represent um, the priesthood of believers carrying the gospel message and the life of Christ to, to, the, to others. Now, instead of taking the blood, though, the priest does not take the blood over to the base of the uh, brazen altar initially and pour it out there. Oh, no. He takes the blood this time, and he goes into the holy place, into the church, okay? And he sprinkles the blood seven times before the veil. Seven times before the veil. Why would that be? What's the veil represent? The lies that we believe and our own carnal natures. That's what separates us. So, why would the blood of Christ be needed to be sprinkled seven times? That seven's that perfect number. Because this was the sinner who was already taken the name of Jesus. This person is a person who was saying, I represent Christ, and has sinned in the body of believers, and has caused damage to the body of believers and damage to the name of Christ. And thus, when we take the name of Christ and we go out and commit sin, do we make it easier for people to see God? Or do we make it harder for people to see God? So we add to the lies. So the blood has to be applied to remove those lies too. And then it is applied to the horns of the golden altar because that represents the heart of the person who has committed the sin in the church. And those horns represent the vestigial character defects that led to that sin. And so the blood being applied is the cleansing of the heart of that person and removing those defects in their character. And the remaining blood afterwards is poured out at the base of the brazen altar representing the power of God to reach the unconverted people when they see the grace and love of God in reconciliation and healing within the Christian community when sin has happened. Washing the organs represents the cleansing of the inner man, removing the guilt, removing the shame, selfishness, separating the fat, burning out the carnal nature and its desires, circumcision of the heart. Burning the organs represents the work of the Spirit to burn out the old desires and recreate new, create new motives. Unity is the goal. The entire drama is to teach God's plan to eliminate sin, restore the universe to oneness at one mint with Him again. The sin offering represents, in symbol, the plan to heal and restore individuals. That's what the sin offering represents, the, the plan to restore an individual heart. The feast days 
represent the grand plan to cleanse the whole planet and the universe. So let's go really quick through the feast days. This will be very fast. Passover, as soon as man fell into sin, Adam and Eve sinned in Eden, God passed over their sins. It says in Romans 3.25, he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He suspended the reaping of eternal death for the purpose of salvation. Christ was the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. This is the Passover Lamb. The time period covered by the Passover feast in human history was the time of Adam's sin until Jesus' death at the cross. That's the time period. The whole Passover covered that whole time. The unleavened bread, immediately after man's sin, God begins dispensing truth unmixed with error, represented by the unleavened bread, the truth, to nurture and to save his people. But it was internalized by people who were in sin, thus bitter herbs. Thus the bitter herbs. This also represents a time from Adam's sin until the victory of Christ at the cross. Same time period. The eating of the unleavened bread represents internalization of, of the Word of God or Jesus Christ. Feast of the first fruits, the first fruits of the victory over death. The wave sheaf represents Jesus. He's the wave sheaf. He is the, the uh, first, ultimate first fruit who was buried and rose again into sinless perfection. Those who rose with him on resurrection morning, and many did, um, to everlasting life, they are the first fruits. The Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, this is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit to apply into the life of believers the achievements that Christ achieved and then bring forth a harvest of souls for his kingdom. This occurred after Christ's death on the cross as the benefits of achievement were dispensed, you know, in 50 days after that. We all know the day of Pentecost when that happened. And this uh, feast symbolically spans the time from AD 33, uh, Pentecost AD 33, all the way until the loud cry. Trumpets, this is the Feast of Trumpets, a special message for the end time. This is a loud cry, the awake, prepare, get ready, it's time to be reconciled, to be brought back into unity, at one minute with God again, prepare for our day of unity with God. This is uh, the late 18th and early 19th century, the great awakening in America and then in Europe. This is the time of the loud cry, this is the Feast of Trumpets. Atonement, reunification with God, oneness with God again. This is the healing and restoration of Christ-like character within the believers, settling into the truth so that one cannot be moved or shaken. This is a time for people on earth to come to a right judgment about God. Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. If you have the human law construct, then that means the time has come for God to have a tribunal, to open up record books, to go through histories, to have Jesus start pleading his blood, to, to pay for the, all this legal rigmarole. If you understand design law, however, you understand that a time has come in human history for people to make a right judgment about God. The hour of his judgment has come. If you think that's kind of really crazy, Romans chapter 3, verse 4, Paul says, God, may you be proved right when you are judged. May you be proved right when you are in Romans 3, 4. Well, what? So how, why would he? He's innocent, okay? You're in a loving, other-centered marriage? I'm trying to see which way I want to tell this. And you believe, and somebody comes to you and tells you a lie that your spouse is having an affair. But they're not. But you believe the lie. And because you believe the lie, you move out. You're not going to live with somebody who's cheating on you. But your spouse, who's innocent, has done nothing wrong, realizes you're the victim of a liar, and still loves you and wants reconciliation. In order to have you reconcile with them, what will they have to do? Won't they have to prove their innocence? Even though they've done nothing wrong. So who's on trial? The innocent one. Who needs to be judged? The innocent one. Fear God, be in awe of God, and give Him glory. Reveal His character. 
God is calling for people at this time in Earth's history to know him so well that they can go out and give the right message about who he is so that others can see that message and make a right judgment about him. Fear God, give glory to him, reveal his character in your life. For the hours come in history for people to make a right judgment about God, worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea. In other words, give the message about the creator designer God whose laws are the laws upon which reality work and stop telling people that God's a dictator who's going to kill them if they don't keep his rules. This is where we are in earth's history. And then tabernacles, the fat last feast. After we have been restored to one minute in heart, in mind, in character, then Christ returns and we tabernacle with him again in an earth made new, our Eden garden home for eternity. Old Testament sanctuary is theater, guys, theater. To reveal God's plan to heal and restore. Salvation is found in the reality, not the symbols. And that reality is Jesus. Today we are in the next to the final act of the drama. We're in the Day of Atonement still. God's still waiting for a people to give that final message about Him. And then we move to the final act, tabernacling with God. And that's it. And we have two minutes now for questions. Yes. Yes. Yes, actually, that's, it's, it's exactly right. So the robe of righteousness is within us as we have a heart change, which is the heart's desire. So we have it. So this is Romans chapter 7. Oh, the things I want to do, I don't find myself doing. But when I do it, it's not me, but it's vestiges of my old self. Okay, so what Paul is actually saying in Romans 7 is that the heart has been changed and the heart wants to be nothing but holy and pure and righteous. The heart is the, heart is the righteousness of Christ. However, however, having lived a life of rebellion and sin for many years, there are some old habit patterns, some reflex responses, some preconceived ideas, some preconditioned reactions, and sometimes, unawares, I reflexively react in certain ways that are wired in that I didn't want to react to anymore. That's not how I want to be, and when I do, I'm grieved because that's not my heart anymore. See, they have the righteousness. They still have some vestigial neural pathways that need to be changed. Okay. Yes. Another question? So we start at 9.30 in the morning? 9.45. Okay. So let's go ahead and close with prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You so very much that when Adam chose to break Your design and change himself and fill his heart with fear and selfishness that You did not abandon humankind that you began immediately intervening to save and to heal. We ask that your Spirit will be poured out upon us now. We ask that the Spirit will take all that Christ has achieved, reproduce it in us. We want to partake of Jesus. We, we open our hearts. We ask that you will write your law of love in, into the inmost being and, and cleanse and renew us to be like you and then empower us to go out and share this final message of mercy to the world so that you will come soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen.